Yeah, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't mention that we had Saturday services. Uh, you know, I love to see this, this full, but this is technically still a holiday weekend, and I'm going, wow. Uh, so uh, just until we're in the, the new place, folks, uh, which, uh, you know, hopefully will be in the next 10 weeks or so, uh, just there's 4.30 and 6 o'clock Saturday services, uh, and the parking is much better. And the thing is, the music and the child care and the sermons are all the same. So I uh, just want to give you that option in case uh, you don't like fighting the traffic on Sunday mornings for the short term, especially in our high season here, uh, January through Easter. So uh, just had to mention that. And after saying that, Happy New Year! Hey, I just want to welcome you to 2016 and remind you that at Calvary, our mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. So if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to know Jesus. If we're going to follow Jesus, we need to know Jesus. And so we're kicking off a series that uh, for more or less is going to last a year Uh, where we're studying the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to walk through the Gospel of Luke uh, and see what Jesus does. We're going to look at at Jesus for the next 52 weeks, how he dealt with people, what he taught, the events of Easter, uh, his interactions, so that we can really experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus that we crave because we know Jesus better. In fact, just to kick off the year, because I know that you know, this time of year, we all want to do better. We kind of look at our lives and go, all right, I got to make some changes. I got to do some things differently. You know, I got to lose the weight that I gained over the holidays, right? Do we all want to lose 10 pounds? Is that kind of the thing? Favorite thing I saw on Facebook, you know, there's this picture of this cat sitting there going, hey, you know what I got for Christmas? I got fat for Christmas. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's just me. That just resonates with me. So uh, you do what you do. But, but here's the thing. We really do want to make uh, a change, but sometimes we set these unrealistic goals and we never reach them. So I want to challenge you to start the year off in a real specific way that you and your family read through the Gospel of Luke in the next month. The month of January. We're on January 3rd. Uh, you can read the entire thing, a chapter a day. Just sit down with your family, whether it's you're alone in your household or whether you've got kids, grandkids, whatever, and you guys read it together and, and get to know Jesus a little bit better. At the end of the month, if you want to continue, if you want to read something else, you want to read it again, however it works for you, that's great. But at least start off this month the right way, getting to know Jesus a little bit better. Gospel of Luke, that's where we're going to spend the next year at. So uh, today we're beginning in Luke chapter 4. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and, and find the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter. If you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the pew Bibles. They look just like this. Turn to page 1093. You will find our text for the day. While you're finding Luke chapter 4, how many have ever experienced rejection? Yeah. Everybody has. You lived any length of time at all, you've been rejected. Starts early when we're kids, right? As soon as your parents say, no. Don't touch that, don't eat that, let go of that, put that down, all that kind of stuff. That's rejection. You're being told no. And then, you know, you get a little bit older and and you don't get picked for the teams or you get picked last for the teams or even worse. At the end, they're going, you take them. (laughs) No, 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 you guys can have them. That's fine. It's rejection. It hurts. You know, you don't get invited to the birthday party or the special event and, and you get your feelings hurt. You get a little bit older and... You get interested in the opposite sex, and so if you're brave enough, you ask them out. At some point, you get turned down. (laughs) Some of us got turned down a lot. It's because I liked girls more than I was afraid of rejection. Figured that out. (laughs) Some of you guys are sitting there going, I never got turned down. It's because you were too chicken to ask. So, (laughs) you know, we get older, and the rejections get a lot more serious, don't they? You don't get into the college that you wanted. You get turned down for a job that you were dreaming of or hoping that you were going to get. You get passed over for a promotion. That's rejection. It gets a little more personal. You have a falling out with friends or family. Some of you don't talk to your parents or your kids or your brothers or your sisters. And, and it carries over and it, it, it reminds us in the holidays of the pain of rejection. Then there's the ultimate rejection that someone who said they were going to love and honor and cherish you for the rest of their lives decides they're going to break that vow. And they're going to walk away and abandon you and divorce you. Rejection hurts. No matter the reason 
for it. No matter the situation, none of us like to be rejected. And I want you to know today that Jesus understands rejection. Jesus understands rejection. Uh, You know, Jesus is God who became a man so that he could understand and save us. And so everything that we've experienced in terms of pain and rejection and, and temptation in this world, Jesus has experienced only without sin. So he understands rejection. Uh, Luke chapter 4, interesting story. Uh, We're going to pick up in verse 16. Jesus has been through the temptation. Uh, He started his ministry down in Capernaum, did some miracles, taught some people and stuff. And then he goes home to Nazareth. Pick up in verse 16. It says, And Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And Jesus said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is, prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them. But only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, Jesus went away. What a weird story, isn't it? I mean, a lot of you have heard parts of that. Maybe you've uh, read through it, but you never really paid attention to it before. But you've got a weird story. You're sitting here like me. The first time I read that through it, I'm going, what happened? What happened? I mean, Jesus goes home, and he he starts preaching and teaching, and people are all like, yeah, that's really sweet. That's nice. Yeah, that's good. And, And then suddenly they're all angry, and they're ready to kill him. So what happened? Well, first thing that happened was Jesus went home and then declared himself the Messiah. Verse 21, that's what he did. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture that he just read was a a prophecy in Isaiah about the Messiah. So Jesus says, hey guys, I've shown up. I'm the Messiah. I'm the chosen one of God. And how do they respond? That's nice. Isn't that nice? Isn't Joseph's boy just such a nice boy? Do you you get that? Instead of responding to Jesus as the son of God, they treated him as the son of Joseph. They didn't respect Jesus for who he told them that he was. They wanted him to perform, and yet he wanted them to recognize him as the Messiah. And so they were condescending. They were disrespectful. They didn't honor him for who he was. So, Jesus got their attention. He basically reminded them, you are not the only ones that God loves. You are not the only people who get the grace of God. In fact, he's trying to tell them God's grace is so much bigger than you can ever imagine or conceive. God's plans for this world are greater than you've ever thought about. He's not just working with the Israelites. And and so then he tells them, Two stories that they already know. Elijah and Elisha, both prophets in the Old Testament, big guys, important guys. 
Elijah is considered the, the greatest prophet. And, and, uh, and Jesus reminds them, hey, three and a half years, it didn't rain on the earth. There's famine, people are dying. And God sends Elijah to a widow to provide her and her family with food and Elijah with food. Only that widow wasn't one of the widows in Israel. There were widows in Israel, weren't there? And they're all like, yeah. How could, God sent him to a Gentile. And, and you remember Elisha? That's the guy who came after Elijah. And, and uh, you know, there were lots of lepers in Israel during that time, but only one was healed, and he was a Syrian. Not only was he a Syrian, he was a general who attacked us. Oh, and they got mad. They got mad. And, and we're sitting here going, why in the world would they get mad? What's the big deal? He's just telling them what they already know. Okay, so here, let me put this uh, in relation. Uh, if I got up here and started denigrating the United States of America, a lot of you would have a problem with that. A lot of you would get angry. Not the Canadians that are here, but the rest of you. <laughs> so um, Canadians would all be like, yep, that's right. Somebody needs to say that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but you, would, you guys would get angry. A lot of you would leave. A lot of you would say things. A lot of you would take issue with that. that. That's kind of on par with what Jesus is doing. He's saying, guys, you think you're all it, that God's only going to work with the, the Israelites, but he's not. He's going to work beyond what you ever imagined. Well, they got angry, and so then they got decided they were going to teach him a lesson. Joseph's boy needs to be taught a lesson. So they grabbed him. What are they going to do? We're going to throw him down the cliff. They're going to kill him. And so they drag him outside. They're angry, and they walk up this hill. It's not a small hill. They go up this hill. I've been there, and they take him to the edge, and they throw him down. It's just a hill full of rocks, and it's steep, and they're, they're going to kill him. And then suddenly it says, Jesus walks away. That's weird. Okay, this weird story just gets weirder because, you know, what's happening? The last time I checked, mobs like, hey, we're going to kill him. Well, it wasn't Jesus' time to die. Okay, we all know that. That's kind of a, a biblical thing. But what happened at that moment? Did they come to their senses along the way? Like, yeah, let's kill him. Oh, okay, maybe let's not. Let's just let him go. Maybe. But here's what I think happened. I think they got to the edge of the cliff, and they're angry, and they're ready to kill him. And Jesus, who had tried to tell them who he was, showed them who he was. I think he did something like this. He got there, and about there to kill him, and he goes, enough! Like every parent has done to their kids in this room. Right? You guys all know that as a parent? Your kid's getting out of hand, they're messing around, and you've had enough, and they're not listening to you, and suddenly you just go, enough! And they all stop like, oh, the authority has spoken. I think that's what happened. Jesus told them, I'm the Messiah. They didn't believe him. They got angry. He got to the edge of the cliff, and suddenly, in just a flash, in just a moment, he kind of revealed his authority and said enough. And they just all froze like those children do when they hear their father's voice. And he walked out of their midst, and they were left wondering, what have we just experienced? Jesus understands rejection. He came into the world he created, and yet he was rejected by the world that he created. The prophet Isaiah, in another prophecy about Messiah, says he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Of course, we know later in the Gospels when it is time, Jesus is rejected by the religious authorities who are representing him and crucified. Wherever you are in your life in terms of rejection and what you've experienced, whether you are alone, whether you are frustrated, whether, you are, whether you're broken or hurting, I want you to know that Jesus understands and the good news, Jesus accepts us. Jesus accepts us. You and me and everyone who comes to him, Jesus accepts. We know this from Jesus' own words. Gospel of John chapter 6 says, Jesus is talking. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus says, look, you come to me, and you're mine. You're in. Think about that. I hope this makes your day. Do you realize that Jesus accepts you forever? It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter how you've failed, how you've made mistakes. None of that matters. If you come to Jesus, he accepts you and he holds on to you and he says, I will never cast you out. 
And some of you feel like, you know, the, the ones who've been excluded. You feel like the cast-offs. You feel like people who aren't cared for. And Jesus is saying, look, I care and I want you to be part of my life forever. This was life-changing for me when I realized this. I know it's hard for some of you to grasp this, but I was a loser. <laughs> Boom. Capital L. Uh, you know, we moved uh, a lot. I was always the new kid, and I wanted to be included. And honestly, I tried too hard. And, and, and so I was always, you know, the, the, the loser in the group and I didn't belong in the group, got excluded a lot. This is how bad it was, because I know some of you are fine. I, I wasn't even cool in the church youth group. <laughs> See, some of you are going, that is pathetic. <laughs> and then, uh, then I realized that the King of Kings accepted me. That he accepted me. Not only that, but he wanted me. And, and so Jesus included me in his kingdom. He included me in his family. And, and, and so it didn't matter who excluded me. Because Jesus included me. And with Jesus, I belong. And, and, and he changed my life. And he wants me in his family. And he wants me to serve him. And he's going to continue changing my life forever. Jesus accepts us when we come to him. So are you accepting or rejecting Jesus? And I know, we're in church, so that's a weird question to ask, right? Strange question. What do you mean, are we accepting or rejecting Jesus? We're here, aren't we? It's Sunday morning. We put on clothes that were less comfortable than the ones we had on and got in our cars and came down here and parked a half mile away and walked in. We're here, of course we accept Jesus. Why would you ask that question? Well, because the scripture we read, Jesus was in a setting just like this when people rejected him. Just like this. Think about this. Rejecting Jesus could mean that you simply get angry at what the Bible teaches. You know, interesting thing, when you challenge people to read the Bible, sometimes they don't like what they read. Sometimes we read it and we go, I don't, I don't really like what this says. And I'm not talking about disagreeing with what men teach the, about the Bible. I'm talking about what the Bible says. Somebody just getting angry at God. I don't, I don't like it. I don't like the way you did stuff. I don't like how you... Okay, that's rejecting Jesus. It, it could mean you simply ignore what God's word says. Because we all are guilty of finding ourselves in the place where we go, well, I know what Jesus said, but I'm going to do what I want anyway. That's rejecting Jesus. It could mean that you think Jesus is nice or wise or a good example but you don't respect him as Lord. You don't submit. You don't embrace him as the authority in your life. You see, accepting Jesus means recognizing Jesus as your Lord, following him as your leader, as your master, embracing his teachings as the way to live. It means that you actually try to do what the Bible says. So honestly, between you and God, are you accepting or rejecting Jesus in your life today? Because here's what happens when we accept Jesus. When we really embrace him as Lord and say, I want to follow you, then Jesus offers us some amazing things. Look at verse 18 again. By the way, your notes say James in your thing. They just that's a typo. It's Jesus. We make mistakes. We fail. He doesn't. So, uh, but look at verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus said, this is what I came to do. This is what Messiah does. So when we accept Jesus, Jesus offers us good news to the poor, to the people who are in need. By the way, that's us. I know we don't feel very poor. Well, after Christmas, we probably do. But, uh, but the truth is we are spiritually impoverished. We are incapable of paying our debt for our sin. We can try to do all the good deeds we want. We can work at it. It's not ever going to pay our debt. Jesus paid our debt for us. The debt we could not pay, he paid. That's what he did on the cross. His death and resurrection paid our debt. That's why we celebrate communion, to remember Jesus' death and resurrection for us because in his shed blood, in his 
broken body, our sins are forgiven. That's the good news. And not only that, but we are adopted into the king's family. He calls us sons and daughters of God. Now think about that. We are so comfortable with the words that are used that we miss out on how incredible that statement is. We, we kind of go, yeah, we're adopted as children of God. It's cool. We ought to be jumping up and down. We ought to be excited. We ought to be celebrating the fact that we are adopted into God's family. Here, here's what I wonder. How would you respond if tomorrow morning a lawyer from Warren Buffett or Bill Gates showed up at your house and said, I want to adopt you into our family? <laughs> yeah, some of y'all get pretty excited, like, woohoo, I don't have to work anymore. I'm going on vacation, I, you know. We'd get excited about that. Why aren't we excited about the fact that the God of all creation accepts us and adopts us into his family and makes us his own? That's good news. So Jesus offers us good news and Jesus offers us freedom from captivity. He says it twice. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He wants us to get this. Now simply put, and we know this, sin makes us slaves. I know, it always looks fun at the beginning, right? So attractive. Satan is excellent at marketing. He, he never delivers what he promises, but he's excellent at marketing. And so he sells this stuff, and we buy in. And we go, yeah, I want to do this. This looks like it's going to be so much fun. And it is for a little while. And then one day we wake up and realize we are servants to our sins. We are slaves to our obsessions. We are prisoners of our addictions. And Jesus offers freedom, liberty. If we follow him, if we learn his word, if we live the truth, the truth will set us free. So Jesus offers forgiveness, Jesus offers freedom, and Jesus offers healing and recovering of sight to the blind. You know, because of sin, we're all broken. We're all hurting. We're all damaged goods. We see that in our own lives. Sometimes we don't see it in the lives of others, but it's there. And Jesus offers you and me healing in two different forms. First of all, he offers perfect, eternal healing. See, part of the hope of the gospel is that one day when we die, we get new bodies, incorruptible bodies, bodies that are free from the suffering and sorrow and the death and the pain. That's good news, isn't it? Some of you are like, can I trade in early? I'm, I'm kind of ready. Others of you are like, yeah, my body's pretty good. I don't need a new one. Just wait. Uh, and uh, you see, but he offers us perfect bodies. And here's the thing. And to go along with the perfect bodies, we get a perfect world. I mean, we just celebrate New Year. We all say, Happy New Year. But it's the same messed up, crazy world that we live in. Right? And it's broken, but here's the thing. Jesus is in charge, and he offers us a new world where one day everything will be better than anything in this world. Did you get that? Everything's going to be better than anything. So Jesus offers us that eternal healing. It's a promise that goes with our gospels that we hold on to because we know that's what our destination is. And Jesus offers healing today. Because we know in Jesus' ministry, he touched people, he healed people, he changed their lives. And, and so he does that still today. So sometimes Jesus offers physical healing. We, we ask and he heals us in what I like to call temporary healing. You ever think about this? You ask God to heal you from your disease, from your illness, from your accident, whatever. And, and, uh, and he does that. He answers that prayer so that you can die from something else. You know, we get all excited, I want Jesus to heal me so that I can die from something else. And sometimes I've run into some people who, you know, live long enough, they kind of wish that they hadn't prayed that. But, uh, but we put a lot of our eggs in that basket if we want temporary healing, but uh, the, the reality is that, that the best is yet to come. So, but here's the thing, it's never wrong to ask God to heal you. He invites us, as, as our loving Heavenly Father, to, to ask Him for, for healing. And sometimes He does that. And a lot of you are miracles in this room because you've experienced God's power. And God is always healing our hearts. 
always healing our hearts. Jesus wants to give us hope. He wants to redeem our brokenness. Take all of our, our smashed pieces that this world has destroyed and put them together in a beautiful package. He wants to bring peace to our souls because he's always with us and he's providing strength and wisdom for the day and he's giving hope for what is to come so that you and I can rejoice in every single day that God gives us. Every single day. So Jesus offers good news. He offers freedom. He offers healing to all who accept him as Lord. To all who come to him, he will never cast out. So I have to close with this question. What is your response to Jesus? What is your response to Jesus today? Uh, some of you have never crossed that line and said, you know what, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, I'm going to follow you with my life. You've never made that decision, that commitment to follow Jesus with your life. And God is calling your name, and you know it, and you need to make that decision. Hey, you need to talk to one of our pastors today. You need to talk to some of the, uh, the prayer team members today. You need to talk to us in the church and just say, hey, well, when can I get baptized? Because God's calling you, and you need to accept him. That's where you're at. So what's your response to Jesus today? What's your response to Jesus this year? I started off the sermon challenging you about reading the book of Luke. And a lot of you are like, yeah, that's a good idea. And you're going to go home and forget about it. Is today going to be different? Because here's the thing. If we don't make changes in our behavior, our lives are going to continue just like they are. And if we want God to do something different, if we want to know Jesus better, then we need to go ahead and step into those changes and make them in our lives so that God can work in our lives. So are you going to go home and you're going to commit? You're going to talk about it on the way home? Hey, when are we going to read the, the Gospel of Luke, a chapter a day? When are we going to do that? What's our plan for our family? Great. What about life group? You know, we want people to connect here at Calvary because we know that life change happens in the context of relationships. And, and, and so we've got life group signups, tables set up on the way out. Robert mentioned it earlier. Uh, and a lot of you thought, yeah, we should get in a life group. Yeah, maybe we'll do that. Don't make it a maybe. Walk out there and check it out and sign up and say, hey, this year we're going to connect. We're going to have that accountability and that encouragement to grow in Christ like never before. If the, those life groups don't work for you, we've got Alpha Life coming in a couple of weeks. We've got women's groups. We've got men's studies. We've got all kinds of groups that meet. So there's something, someplace you can connect. Some of you have been thinking about going to Celebrate Recovery. You know you've needed it for a long time. You know your life is stuck in a rut. You, need, you know you need help. And, and you've been saying, I need to go to celebrate. Don't think about it. Do it. Tomorrow night at 6.30. Right here. Some of you, you've been thinking about serving. You go, yeah, we, that's right. We kicked off that serve ministry. And I was going to sign up. And I never did turn in that form. I never went online. I was going to go online. I just didn't do it. Is today going to be that day? You see, what is God calling you into? What deeper waters are you willing to go into so that God can change your life, so that you can get to know Jesus and become the son and daughter of God that he wants you to do? What is your response to Jesus going to be? I pray it's not like that home synagogue in Nazareth that didn't respect him, but simply dismissed him as Joseph's boy. He's Jesus. What does that mean for you? Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for the gifts that you give, most of all the gift of eternal life. And Lord, you know the times in our lives when we do things our way instead of your way, and today we repent. We just confess that we're failures and we need your grace and your mercy, and we know it's available. Thank you for the promise that if we come to you, you will never cast us out. So, Father, right now, as we continue to worship, let us hear your voice clearly and give us the courage, the faith, the strength to follow you differently so that we can know you better in 2016. In Jesus' name, amen.